Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you can enjoy Richard's pro, uh, program. Uh, Richard is recording this and we'll figure a way to put it out for members that weren't able to get on tonight. Um, it, as way of introduction, I'm gonna tell you all too, probably the best thing for you to do is to put your view on speaker view so you can see Richard, but uh, basically he'll probably be putting a lot of, of uh, pictures up and has a lot to say. Let me tell you a little bit about Richard. Uh, I can't give you a thorough biography because this man is such a Renaissance man. We've been friends since the mid to late eighties and um, sold real estate together for years. But that's, I, I know Richard on so many other levels because he has had an incredible career, not only in real estate, but also he's an amazing car collector. He's got an incredible collection of cars and so he can speak at length about that he can speak at length at length of many 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 subjects um, and he's also an architectural historian and he has great knowledge of architectural styling and so amongst those of us in the real estate community in los angeles he's one of the foremost experts on historic properties and how they should be restoration restored and how they should be marketed so um, we're really kind of lucky to have Richard with us tonight. But tonight, he's sharing a part of his life that was, I think, really amazing. And I've seen his presentation before, and I, I cannot wait to see it again, because he was the personal secretary for George Kukor in the last years of George's life. And he has stories to tell and photos to show. And um, he will regale us, as I'm sure you've, you've never been regaled about this incredible man. And I put a little bit out with the advertisement on George Kukor for many people who are not real aficionados of, of the golden era of Hollywood. They might not be familiar with him as a director as much as they are with his films, but when you think back to Dinner at Eight, um, which was earlier in his career, and then you take it all the way to My Fair Lady, and in between you have, he was the first director on Gone with the Wind. He was, uh, he did, um, uh, the women, and he did Philadelphia Story, and well, Richard will go on and on. George Cukor was a major part of the golden era of Hollywood. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy this program along with you, and I present my dear friend and uh, our presenter tonight, Richard Stanley. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Don. Um, I think I, uh, I'm not sure what everyone sees. Let me get the, oh, can you see that? No. Okay, let me, uh, there, can you see it now? Nope, we're seeing you. Okay, I, I've got to somehow figure out to share the screen. Uh, I have to do, you have to let me do screen share, I think is what it, what it means. Well, you're co-host, so you can, you can do that. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see in the center a big green share screen. Okay, there we go. There you go. Okay, and then now I will play this. Um, okay, and you can hear me? Uh, we can hear you and we can see you and it's lovely. All right, so let me get off there. And just a little about um, what I what I would like to, what, I'm not a film historian and I'm not here tonight to talk about George's filmography and his career. I knew George as a personal friend for the last five years or so of his life. And we hit it off very quickly. And he was 51 years my senior. I was in my 20s. And he needed somebody to be sort of his lieutenant at times. And um, so I, I got to um, see, as he called them, the people of the world in a way that I ordinarily would never have uh, had the opportunity to do so. And I wasn't in real estate. I was kind of in my 20s, sort of floating around from job to job. So I had the luxury of, of uh, stopping and starting with different jo jobs and going on amazing adventures with one of the great uh, film directors of Hollywood's golden era. And let me see if I can, oops. Let me see, I'm not uh, getting how I can do this. Let me, okay, I guess I just click. So 
everybody asked me at some point, how did I meet George Cukor? And at the in, in my 20s, my first job when I got out of grad school and I moved to California, I went to school at Rochester Institute of Technology. I grew up uh, and went to school in um, Reading, Pennsylvania at Albright College. So I, I had, after two years of grad school, I wanted to go somewhere that um, where a palm tree grew in the ground and I had a photography background from uh, studying photography in grad school at Rochester Institute of Technology. I came out here in the middle of a recession. The best job I could find was a magazine editor in Canoga Park at a mag what I called the magazine factory. So it allowed me to do interviews and freelance uh, because I worked only four days a week. So one of the interviews that I did for a gay publication that was called In Touch in those days um, was of the, uh, the playwright, um, Jamie Herlihy, who lived in Silver Lake. This is Jamie's living room. He was very bohemian, extremely sweet and wonderful and fascinating. Uh, he wrote Midnight Cowboy and Blue Denim. And so he, the, the interview came out. He, called me up and said, I like the interview. Would you mind coming to dinner sometime? And, and he called me, invited me to dinner and said, would you mind picking up one of my dinner guests who doesn't drive anymore? And I said, no, not at all. He lives over near you somewhere. And I said, he, he, Jamie said, his name is George Cukor. And my first thought was after having seen the men who made the movies in at RIT over and over and over, which was a very um, fascinating um, film series on directors of the golden era, one of which was George. There was a whole uh, segment on George. I thought he had died, but no, not at all. So I went over to 9166 Cordell Drive. And this is the way house George's house looks kind of today. At the time I knew George, it was not painted pink. Uh, and it was the brickwork was completely covered in ivy. His bedroom is the window behind uh, up toward the top of the hill. You couldn't even see really the hill. There was so much overgrowth. And, but you came in the door from, this is the other side of that door in that um, uh, wall. And as soon as you walked in, there was there was water dripping and there was this rich lush quiet and uh at the top of the stairs was george waiting for me to go to dinner at jamie herlihy's and the first thing george said to me was how about a drink now he spoke mid-atlantic so and most of his friends did which is that sort of neither american nor english accent but um Anyway, uh, I said, George, I don't think we have time. So I got him at the time I was driving a uh, 64 Cadillac, a uh, gold 64 Eldorado convertible. I thought, wow, he's really old. I better get the top up. And I hit the button, got him in the car, hit the button and the top began to whir up. And he said, no, 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 I love an open car. And we went down to Sunset Boulevard, past the Roxy, and suddenly I'm thinking to myself, I better not have an accident. I've got an Academy Award winner in my passenger seat. And he, um, the hand started going across the wheel. Marvelous, marvelous. And I looked at what he was pointing at, which was a line of surfer type guys lined up to get into the Roxy in that golden light of this time of year, actually in July. Uh, in fact, it was about the, exactly this, this date in 1977 that I met him. And I'm looking at the surfers and I'm looking at this elderly gent and I'm thinking, oh, he's one of us. So anyway, I thought I'd just show you some of the photographs. Uh, these are not in chronological order or really tight order in any way but this was the garden when you came up the stairs on the left the pool was toward the south george's bedroom was up at the top i don't think you can see the cursor can you it's right here yes you yes can see, you can see the cursor good yeah uh and that view uh george had george one of george's um traits that led him to great success was attention to detail. And he had um, Paul Landacre, who was a well-known 
uh, graphic artist, woodblock printer, design his book plate, which is on the left here from this drawing that Paul Landaker did of his garden. And he had, speaking of the garden, he had uh, Florence Yock and Lucille Council, who were lovers, partners in business, uh, do the landscape design. And the idea of the landscape, it was an unusually shaped lot. The, the original house was up here at the top on the left. And then he had James Delena redesign the house completely um, in the uh, mid early mid 30s. He bought the property around 1933 and then greatly expanded the house and had William Haynes, who was a matinee idol, um, and then was sort of thrown out of show business because of an incident with his partner, Jimmy Shields. So they went into interior design and uh, Bill Haynes did the interior design work of George's house. Bill Haynes' last commission, by the way, was the uh, um, American Embassy in London when the Annenbergs, uh, when Walter Annenberg was the ambassador from the US to Great Britain. So, and if, by the way, if you ever want to see a lot of what George's house looked like in flavor, you can go to Descanso Gardens. And if you go up to the top of the hill through the main part of the garden, you will get to the house of the owner of the Descanso Gardens and his name escapes me, but it is was built at the same time by James Delena uh, in the same style that he did for George, which was Hollywood Regency. And Lucille, this is sort of the um, early, an early view before the, the garden grew in around the pool. And that uh, is uh, Rosalind Russell by George's pool. This is the interior as it was originally designed by, um, by Bill Haynes. And this is from about 1940. And then later, this is a black and white photo, but the colors were toned down. It's the, the main uh, sitting room. It had Aubusson upholstered chairs. And it, it's very, I mean, it's a style that's very popular now, but it takes a lot of dough to recreate that, as I'll show you soon. George adored dogs. The only photographs in his bedroom, he had a bedroom suite, but in the sanctum sanctorum of his bedroom, the only photographs um, in that room were of his dogs, past and present, in Tiffany silver frames. Um, here he is playing with them. They could get dogs. He had no patience about, he had no um, stomach for training them. Kate used to say about his last dog, Whitney, that it was a dead loss because it was completely untrained. Now this looks like George at his house, but it actually is the set of Marilyn Monroe's last picture, which was called Something's Gotta Give with Dean Martin. And they came uh, in pre-production, they had a meeting in George's house. Uh, he was the director, of course, and they, asked or the problem they had was that a lot of the action was exterior and they knew with Marilyn Monroe's um, tardiness that she they would never be able to match action so they had to build an exterior set on an on a sound stage in interior on the in, inside so somebody said well how are we going to what kind of style and somebody looked around and said why don't we just replicate George's house on the sound stage, which is in fact what they did. They had at enormous expense built this set and then the picture was never completed for a whole raft of reasons. And uh, Marilyn, I think was fired after she went um, notoriously to Madison Square Garden and sang happy birthday, President Kennedy. They wondered, well, if she's not well enough to work, she was complaining she wasn't well enough to work. Um, I, how did she have the energy to go to New York and sing in Madison Square Garden? They fired her in June, in August she died. So they had this very expensive set. They recycled it for a Doris, Doris Day movie, Move Over Darling. 
George adored his house. It was his world. And he used to every year at the, at the time of the Academy Awards, usually the Friday before the awards, he would host a luncheon at his house for the um, past winners and nominees in the best director category. So here are a few here. There's Billy Wilder, uh, William Wyler, um, Oh, I forget this man, uh, uh, George Stevens, uh, Luis Buñuel, Alfred Hitchcock, Ruben Mamoulian, uh, Robert Wise, whoops, and I, I don't know whether I can go back. Yeah, I can go back. Um, and um, anyway, there are a bunch, I, I may skip a couple of names. Of course, George is in there. Um, some other photographs of George's house. Everything was spit and polish. Oh, by the way, if you went in this door next to the pool, the one on the end there, there was a collection of bathing suits for men, and they were all from the mid-30s made out of a heavy wool jersey in large sizes. I remember not nobody wore them. But uh, here's Whitney, his last dog. You'll notice where on the set, the... Um, the swimming pool is where the lawn is. And the picture of George standing what next to what looks like his swimming pool was actually one of his Christmas cards. And it said, Merry, Happy Christmas, he always said. And when you tilted it up, you could see the rafters of the rigging on the soundstage. I always loved how the jacaranda tree would drop its purple flowers and you'd have these floating purple islands in the water of this pool. And by the way, this pool had no heater. It was a very old pool. It was built in the 30s, um, had a sort of a, a rigged um, filtration system, but no heat. And it was like ice until maybe the third week of September. However, Kate Hepburn, who lived on the property in the house with Spencer Tracy down the hill, George owned a compound of about four houses on that corner. She used to come up every morning at 7 a.m. and swim in this icy pool, and she loved it. Here is uh, Kate and George on the set of Philadelphia Story, and you can see how that set kind of reminds me anyway, a little bit of George's sort of Hollywood Regency house. These are just some photos. Most of the pictures in this set I took, but not all of them. This particular bench, not a great photograph. However, the sun used to hit it. It was underneath George's bedroom on the right off the lawn next to the pool. And the sun would hit it in the afternoon and it burned the white vinyl um, upholstery and George asked me one day, could you, could you, uh, um, could you, um, could you have it redone somehow? I said, I could do that myself. So I just popped the cushion off, bought some upholstery material, took the old thing off. I was down on my hands and knees, stapling it together from the bottom. It was just a piece of plywood. And suddenly over my left shoulder, I heard this marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. And I looked around and it was Kate Hepburn. That's how I met Catherine Hepburn on my knees, reupholstering this bench. Oops. And these are just some um, photographs. He had beautiful landscaping, again, thanks to Lucille Council. I noticed that the landscaping, you don't see tropical plants. You don't see palm trees and that kind of, it's more of like the English garden than, um, than a California semi-tropical garden. This was the first like portrait, I guess you could say of George that I took in his bedroom. Everywhere you went in his house, there were fresh flowers. Um, and one time we had to throw away some household receipts that had gotten soggy when we had a very heavy rain down in a California basement. And I looked at one and during World War II, the, the bill from the florist for the whole house full of flowers was something like $14 and 35 cents. And I asked him uh, one time, I said, he was the highest paid director in Hollywood in the thirties. And I asked him, I said, what would you make back then? 
He said, oh, I don't know. I said a quarter of a million dollars. He said, oh yeah. So if you can imagine earning about $250,000 in 1937, this is the Oval Room, which was one of the great rooms of Hollywood. It was, again, Bill Haynes' design. It had a pale blue ceiling with copper cornice moldings and soffit lights that were incandescent. This is before rope LED lights. And when you would turn these on, as the lights would warm up, the copper would heat up and you could hear it tick, 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 tick as it warmed up and then tick, tick, tick as it cooled down when you turned the lights off. Um, the, um, the floor, the first time I went into George's house, I was at one of his um, notorious pool parties on Sunday afternoon, which was a sort of a regular thing in the warmer weather. Um, and um, uh, Bruce Grega, who was a photographer and the partner of Victor Skrebnesky, no, he was the interior designer, Victor Skrebnesky, his partner was the photographer. Anyway, George said, Bruce, take Richard through the house. And so I walked with a towel over my shoulder in a swimming suit across this floor. It was like I were, were walking, as if I were walking on fine furniture. The, um, the uh, fireplace mantle is copper. The crystal was a gift from um, Kate Hepper. And I think the painting above the, the, um, the fireplace is a Brock. This is the, the dining room. And of course, and if you've ever seen Gods and Monsters, uh, the film with Ian McKellen and Brendan Fraser, uh, the James Whale house looks a lot like some of the interiors of George's house, even though George is depicted in that film in this grand Brentwood kind of estate, which was the antithesis of what his house really was like. But um, George used to uh, sit at the right at the head of the table where there was a button under the table where he would jump on that thing sometimes to get the uh, staff in the kitchen to hop to. Oops, I don't know whether I can do that. There's a picture of the other end. The black, oh, I was, one of my things, I very quickly became the person who would light the Blackamore candles for dinner because I was usually taller than most people. And um, this is the picture, of, a picture of the sitting room looking out to where we would eat um, in the summer. You can see the the red sofa is now sort of a rose. This is the other end looking toward the guard, actually looking toward uh, the uh, Sierra Tower on sunset. The um, painting above the fireplace, this is in the sitting room again with these beautiful gessoed oak panels on the walls. Um, it's a Renoir pastel and the painting over on the left is a Grant Wood that Kate Hepburn gave to George that is now in the University of Kansas um, library or museum, I think. It, there, I think Grant Wood only, he's the one who of course did American Gothic. And I think he did only about 75 uh, paintings and Kate gave him this one. It was painted in um, about 1933 and George decided in the 70s, you could donate things in advance of your death and take a tax credit, which George did with this painting. He donated it to the Grant Wood Museum. And um, when one day, I used to sometimes fill in with, he had a full-time secretary. So sometimes when his secretary would be on vacation, I would fill in. And George passed me a letter one time and didn't say a word, I read it. And it was the curator of, the Grant Wood collection asking George whether he couldn't donate the painting before he died. And I thought, ooh, that sort of hits the wrong note. And George, I handed the letter back and told him that. And George said, I have a mind to just not give it to him anymore. And I talked him out of it. So it's, it's where it belongs, even though there was a letter that almost scuttled that plan. These are just, you can see the beautiful finish on the gessoed oak. This is back to the oval um, room that uh, had the suede wallpaper. 
this is a little sitting room where we used to um, go after dinner a lot. We usually had drinks in the oval room and then after dinner came into this room. The little painting on the easel here on the chair is a, um, a Renoir that was painted from Renoir's um, Renoir's room overlooking the Promenade des Anglais in Nice and was in the collection of André Durand. And then it was, uh, uh, Vivian Lee owned it. And when Vivian Lee died, she left it to George. And one time I came in, George had a family when I first met him of uh, Chinese help. And they used to, um, they didn't get that house. They were just there to work and dust. And I came into the room one time and I could just feel something was off. And I looked over here on the table and they had put the Renoir into it, onto its easel upside down. I mean, they were, they were hilarious, the, the fights that George used to have with them. This is Alan Searle, who was Somerset Mom's uh, last secretary and lover, um, who used to come and stay for like, uh, I don't know, nine months a year sometimes, just going through the house. This was George's um, sitting room off his bedroom with a picture of his parents. There's the chair that I took the photograph in, which I think is where he died watching um, The Graduate. This was a little uh, powder room off between his office and that little sitting room where the Renoir was on the easel. And he had it all stacked up with Christmas cards that his friend George Hune used to make and send out. When Hune died, he died a few years before I came on the scene. So I did this picture of Whitney and made it into a Christmas card that he sent out with sort of a collage of the magnolias. But these are some of the ones that George had that were the Christmas cards from the 50s and the 60s that were all, this one on the left here, this little curtain would go up and down, this thing folded out three-dimensionally. Um, George Hune was really a brilliant photographer, and very clever designer. This was all George Hune's work from 1959. Again, George's dogs everywhere. And then the, the little room between um, the sitting room and the, his office was floor to ceiling uh, photographs that were autographed to him by people he had worked with. Uh, this up here is Rex Harrison, John Barrymore, Spencer Tracy, Ava Gardner. My favorite, I don't think you could see it on here, is, um, was Joan Crawford's that was autographed, Darling George, the marriage offer still stands, love Joan. And here's George in his office. He had an Emmy up here and an Oscar here. This painting we got when we went to China. Um, this is where he would sit and um, sort of go over the mail and things with his secretary. It's a beautiful uh, George Hune uh, dye transfer print of Kate Hepburn. This picture here, is a drawing by John Singer Sargent of Ethel Barrymore that she left to him when she died. These are Goya. I think this is a Matisse maybe, but this is the, the this original was in George's collection. There's Alan goofing around. And then downstairs was the guest room. George was, inducted into the Légion d'honneur by um, the uh, French Minister of Culture in Paris on one of our trips. And they gave him this uh, um, Camille poster from the French issue. And George said, where are we gonna put it? And I said, why don't we build a sort of a framed things that's hinged. So I had this thing framed and built it for him so he could get to the books behind. This was the guest room. Audrey Hepburn used to stay here and I don't know, all, all of his friends. And that's Margaret, the German housekeeper. And this is her husband, Albert, who was the gardener and the chauffeur. 
So one day George said, um, let's go to London. You'll like my friends, uh, Sam and Mildred Jaffe. We'll take Sarah Mankiewicz, who was, whose husband was Herman Mankiewicz. She wants to go to Israel before um, she dies, but we're going to stop in London along the way. So we visited Sam and Mildred Jaffe, and this was their flat 15 Eaton Square, which I just read recently has been completely taken over by the oligarchs from Russia. They now call it not Eaton Square, but Red Square. Um, and I just was fascinated. This was uh, their, um, their maid, the Jaffe's, their little wall here. So this is Mildred Jaffe, and of course, George and Sarah Mankiewicz going out for a walk on Eaton Square. And some, some of these pictures, I, I would just, you know, grab, I, they were just grab shots when we were walking around. And they had a party. Mildred was the most elegant woman I ever knew, absolutely hilarious. And she, as you can see up here, they had a Calder mobile called the Red Lily and instead of the chandelier in their flat in London. And um, Sam and Mildred were big art collectors in Beverly Hills. Sam ran the Jaffe Agency, which is now the Gersh Agency, and long story. But um, he used to represent, by the way, Ian McKellen, among many, many people, brought Richard Burton to the States. But um, anyway, they... Um, um, they knew Alexander Calder, Sandy Calder, and, and Mildred fell in love with his mobile. And Sam said, but where are you going to put it, Mildred? And she said, under my bed. So they bought it for $2,500. It's probably, I don't know how many millions it's worth now. We used to stay a lot at the, um, the Connaught, which was a really fun old line hotel. This is Alan Davis, who was a producer um, in London, he, he had a long running hit called No Sex Please, We're British, and Emlyn Williams, who wrote The Corn is Green, which George had just recently made into a TV movie. And then uh, we went to Israel, <clears throat> which George hated. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of George. George, Sam Jaffe, and one of the fellows uh, at the Wailing Wall. And Sam was the son who was going to be the rabbi in his family. And he said, now, Richard, when we go, and I'm the, sort of like the Shabbos boy, he says, now, Richard, when we go to the Wailing Wall, the custom is that you give a donation to the first poor person you um, meet. So this fellow came over to Sam and Sam gave him a donation. And Sam went and, and said his prayers. George, as you can see, looks very uncomfortable. He didn't quite know what to do. And I was just sort of taking in the whole scene here. Sam finished his prayers, turned around. This same guy there is there with his hand out. And Sam says, without missing a beat, no, go on, get out of here. I already gave something to you. And the guy says to Sam, without missing a beat, so you can give again. So we, Sam and I ditched Mildred and Sarah and George, and they went to Tel Aviv, and we went to the Dead Sea and Masada, which was wonderful. This was just a tourist, more tourists, more tourists. And of course, the dome of, uh, of the, the mount. And um, this has been in the news lately. <clears throat> As you may recall, it's the second or third holiest site in Islam. It's where allegedly um, Muhammad ascended into heaven. And so we, after a week in Israel, George couldn't take it anymore. And we went to visit Alan Searle in Monte Carlo. Uh, and Sarah went back to Los Angeles and long, many stories involved in that. But we went to Monte Carlo, which was much more George's speed. And George and Alan loved to get into mischief. This was uh, lunch one day in Monte Carlo and George is checking out these Italians 
uh, he sort of not eavesdropping because he didn't speak Italian, but uh, he was fascinated with people and how they comport themselves, checking the, the scene out. This woman was a Swedish noblewoman and in the uh, Hotel de Paris, which is where I stayed. And um, it was just, I couldn't believe the amount of food. So we went in to the bar at the Hotel de Paris one afternoon, very quiet, and sat down and across the room were these three ladies and George just looked at me and said, he, they intrigued him. So he said, let's go introduce ourselves. So we went over there and it turned out that this woman's daughter was this woman and she was a Greek um, of some Greek nobility and this woman had married very well and was a British actress. So they all knew George and they were just, just charmed by him and allowed me to click away while George sort of ran interference. This was in Alan's um, flat in Monte Carlo and he had a friend um, that we used to joking we call Lady Darley. Her name was Elizabeth Darley, I think. And she was a lot of fun, British. And um, I'll just click through some of these. Very animated. Her, her late husband was involved with the Darley racehorses. And um, this was at Alan's table. George in the sitting room. This picture I love. This is Alan and um, uh, Elizabeth Darley with Alan's manservant. It's, uh, the, Alan had brought all this Chippendale furniture from England and he said at times it was so dry in Monte Carlo that you could hear the wood crack. This was my bedroom or my room at the Hotel de Paris, which was fun to just sort of get up in any time and watch the dawn or the night action of the casino. And we used to eat a lot at a place called La Reserve de Beaulieu, which is, I think it gets one star on the Guide Michelin in Beaulieu and um, Alan loved it. He always, uh, he, 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 at this point in his life, I think he was so depressed after living without Somerset mom for so many years, he just ate whatever he liked. And at the end of the meal, he would just, you know, tell the waiter, le chariot, s'il vous plaît, and they'd bring on the creme chanty, and there he is with it. Back to a dinner at his house. And then we would get home, and there would be Margaret and the dog, and whoever was the maid at the house. There you can see how they the wall was completely covered in ivy. And then the first night back, uh, we would have the old guard over uh, and I would tell the stories. George would prompt me and I would tell the stories. So George would periodically just call. He never said hello. When you picked up the phone, he would just start talking. So he said, why don't we go to that place where you buy suits? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know, that place where you buy suits. I said, Hong Kong? He said, yeah. I said, when are we going to go? He's there, oh, in a couple of weeks. Irene will call you with the details. And then we'd be off to some incredible place. And on the way, we went to Taiwan. And this was our guide who, uh, his name was Irving. The Chinese people all have very strange um, Anglo-Saxon names and George said oh nice Jewish boy and um, so this was our we toured around Taiwan and George was given the equivalent of like an Oscar at the Chinese Academy Awards which were in a southern city called Kaohsiung and we met uh, Anna Bing Arnold's nephew who was a doctor over there and had married a Taiwanese woman and was doing research in um, uh, hepatitis 
vaccine research, research at the time. And we also met uh, two other people who had gone to that same um, award ceremony, Michael Wiener and his wife, Deborah Raffin, who was an actress and had been in a, um, I forget which play or film she was in, but anyway, they invited us to go to Hong Kong, the place where you buy suits. So this is what Hong Kong looked like around 1980. Uh, much different today. We had we went into the uh, first, we were among the first people in the Regent Hotel, which was on the water. And George would like to, he was 70 something, he would take a nap and he woke up and this was sort of like the scene out our window. And I was watching a Chinese golden era movie that reminded me a lot of the quality of Hollywood films and George's pictures of that era. And I, I said to George, uh, he looked out there, he's there, he's looking out the window, he's there, where are we? And I said, oh, come on, George, look at the TV. And he just looked at me and he said, Canada. I said, no, we're in Hong Kong. So to make sure he knew where we were, we went on a tour of Hong Kong by boat and the ferry and the place where you buy suits and get acupuncture and we rode up to victoria peak with deborah raffin the region hotel was right here i think and so they were they convinced george to go with them to the mainland um, of china so we went running through this thing and onto a train and we got onto a train to Canton or are no, known as um, um, Guangzhou, I guess. Is it Guangzhou? Um, anyway, um, so we're on this train and there was a trade show on, in the city and um, a whole bunch of people from Italy, again, Italians, talking loudly, gesturing and so on. And they're in the back of the train car and George is dozing off. You can see Michael and Deborah passed out too after this going across into communist mainland red China. And so George wakes up and he looks out the window and he sees this sort of a scene with water buffaloes. And he says to me, I have no idea where we are why we are going there and why we are on a train full of Italians. So we had lunch. We had this one German guy who was among our tour. And we got finally got to um, Guangzhou, I guess it is. And um, yeah, Kaohsiung was the uh, place in Taiwan. We got to Guangzhou and George commented on this Chinese or Russian limousine, he said, oh, it reminds me of my roles. Now, at this time, George needed suits because he had lost a lot of weight and he would walk around like this, frankly, holding up his, his pants. So he would appreciate some new uh, suits. And this was our hotel room in Guangzhou, which reminded me of a room in the Reading Railroad Company YMCA and George was bundled up here because he was cold and I could not find the thermostat to turn the heat on. It was kind of chilly and windy. And I finally went to the concierge in her Mao jacket and explained the situation. And she finally got it. And she looked at me and gave me a scowl and said, no heat south of Yangtze. That was it. So I just went back and gave George my blankets and he was fine. These are just some shots. And I, this was in, on an island that the uh, British and French ran the opium trade from. And when I got back to uh, LA, I told Christopher Isherwood, who was a good friend of George's about this trip. And he said, oh yes, Auden and I went there in 1936 and we went to the British consulate and had tea and during the tea, the windows began to rattle and the ground shake because the Japanese were coming over and bombing the city. And the British consul kept serving them tea 
And when he noticed that they were alarmed, he said, oh, pay it. No, never mind. They do this every day at this time. So we went uh, into dinner. And because Deborah had a sort of B picture career, and Michael was her manager over here on the right, he had sold a lot of or syndicated a lot of her pictures in China, mainland China. And this was our guide on the left. And he overheard the waiter and the waitress talking about Deborah because they had recognized her. And they were so impressed that Deborah, that they were serving dinner to Deborah. And George was very patient, waited, and finally had to, he looked at them and said, me, started pointing to his, himself, me, George Cukor, my fair lady. And they looked at him like, huh? And that's when everybody began. You can see they have no idea what my fair lady was. And of course, Deborah and Michael just collapsed. So we went out, visit a commune. George had to always relieve himself. This was, he, he found this fellow in the, in the commune and he said, oh, he reminds me of my uncle Ollie. This sweet picture of Deborah. So Deborah and Michael invited George and me to their farm in Vermont for Christmas. So off we went. And this is Senator Aiken of Vermont who came by, signed a book for George. This was Christmas morning. Deborah gave us each um, these red long johns from Bloomingdale's. Of course, George looked like the oldest Christmas elf. George adored Deborah and likewise. We would get to New York about once a year for some purpose. And often we stayed at the UN Plaza, which I loved because I love the UN building. And George was the executor of George Hune's estate. And George Hune's heir was Horst, the fashion photographer who lived in New York and with his partner, Nicholas Lawford, who's the fellow in the center who was related to Peter Lawford and was a British diplomat. Uh, and so we had lunch at the Russian Tea Room and went to the uh, opening. This is Bill Ewing at the International Museum of Photography. Uh, where they had uh, George Hune's photographs. And we had a dinner, which I don't have pictures of, uh, at Jackie Onassis's um, penthouse on Fifth Avenue. And Horst came up to me at the dinner party and he said, you know, I am going to be coming to California to do a project and I am looking for someone who has a car, knows Los Angeles and knows photography. And I said, you're looking at him. He said, good, I was hoping you would say that. So he came to California and we did, um, we spent two weeks traveling around. This is a nice photo, I think of, of Nicholas Lawford and Horst photographing old movie actresses. And we went up to Montecito. Jim Waters wrote the book, which by the way, is the best bargain on eBay uh, or Amazon. And um, it's really, it's basically, Jim Waters is a, was the entertainment editor for Life Magazine. And he did a segment in Life of about six, uh, old movie actresses and had Horst come back and photograph them as they were in 1979 or so. Anyway, he got a book deal out of it. And in 1980, we went around and we photographed in two weeks, 42 old movie queens. And um, this was up in Montecito. This was Eleanor Boardman, also up in Montecito. And another time we went to New York, we went to a Barrymore tribute 
because uh, George had directed um, some of the Barrymores and was a close friend of Ethel and so on. And um, on the way, before we went, I went over the schedule and I noticed that there was a lunch set up for um, George with the Canaans, Garson Canaan and Ruth Gordon. And I thought, uh-oh, because when the book Moviola came out, which was like a transcript of a lot of conversations that George and Kate Hepburn and Spencer Tracy had at dinner parties at George's house, Kate felt very betrayed and wouldn't speak to them again, even though they were her next door neighbors on East 49th Street. So they moved out, moved to the Dakota, and I didn't think that George was on good terms with them. In the meantime, they did a TV movie called, based on the book, on, called Moviola, of course. And here is George in Moviola and Kate Hepburn in Moviola. And when we got into the limo in New York, um, I was picking up the luggage and I stuck, I opened the door and he said, it's George Cukor. And I said, yeah, George, it's Richard. He said, no, it's George Cukor. And he was pointing to the television in the limousine as I'm picking up our bags and they're playing this scene. And I thought, oh my God, it's gonna be a disaster when we meet the Canaans for lunch. It couldn't have been nicer. The, here they are at the Russian tea room and Ruth Gordon, fantastic storyteller. You know, we go in there and she, she said, she just commanded the attention of everybody in a room. She said, now I want your undivided attention. I want to tell you that we are sitting in Saul Hurok's booth. So anyway, uh, she, it worked out great. And we had, these were some friends and I cannot remember their names. It's driving me crazy. But uh, this was also at the Russian Tea Room. And this is Paul Morrissey. We saw him while we were on one of the trips. Um, he was Andy Warhol's um, director. So we went to the Barrymore tribute, which was wonderful. Everybody was on his and her best behavior, but everybody was hungry after the, the presentation. So George and I invited everybody up to our rooms in the hotel. So who came along was, um, this is um, John Barrymore the third, I believe. This is Drew Barrymore, his half-sister, and Myrna Loy. And this is uh, James Casillabus Davis, who wrote a book on the Barrymores, and that was why he was there. And um, George adored uh, Drew Barrymore. Now, remember, she was six or seven years old and had this wee little girl voice. And I took the orders from everybody and went to the telephone and she came over to me and she said, let me do the ordering. I said, well, of course, go right ahead. So we went, I went around the room and everybody, you know, it's five club sandwiches and, you know, three diet Cokes and her, and, and she's repeating this in her little girl voice into the telephone. And her half brother says, and a pitcher of dry martinis. And she says into the phone, and a pitcher of dry martinis. And then she pauses realizing what she has just said and says, this is no joke. So anyway, the room service arrived and notice Drew's outfit and notice the star quality at six or seven years old. I mean, the camera just loved her. This was her mother in the back and how she could charm an older gentleman like Johnny Carson. So right after or about this time, she was on the Johnny Carson show in the same dress. And it's a, if, you go, if you look it up on um, YouTube, it's a charming, adorable interview. And years later, when Drew Barrymore had her own TV show, they computer generated um, that or they took that footage of the Tonight Show and Drew Barrymore interviews at 45 interviews her 
six-year-old self in that same dress. And these were some other pictures that I took at the, uh, our, uh, that's Drew Barrymore's half brother and his girlfriend and Myrna Loy, of course. And this picture is of course of me and Myrna Loy taken by Drew Barrymore. And she, com she uh, commits the classic uh, faux pas in photography of putting a lampshade on somebody's head but I love it. The mother, Drew Barrymore's mother. So another time we went to New York. Uh, oh, no, no, this was the same trip. We went to, um, no, it wasn't. It was a different trip. This is the RKO reunion in New York. And there are some people here I can't remember, but this is um, um, Ruth Donnelly, Ruby Keeler, Margaret Hamilton, Arlene Dahl, Constance, or uh, Joan Bennett, George, John Lodge, uh, Van Johnson, and I can't remember these, these fellows, but um, this was at uh, an RKO reunion, again, upstairs at the Russian Tea Room. George and John Lodge, who later became an ambassador and governor of Connecticut. Van uh, Johnson, who was introducing himself as Van Heflin. Uh, Rady Harris, who was a gossip columnist in New York, Ruby Keeler. George says, you look exactly the same. Ann Miller. I always remember with Ann Miller that what's the Hollywood Squares question? What is the hardest material known to man? Ann Miller's feet, soles of Ann Miller's feet. Joan Bennett. Then when we got back to LA, we bumped into by accident at the uh, luggage uh, turnstile, uh, Margaret Booth, who lived to be 104 and was one of the great pioneer um, film editors. We went to San Francisco to publicize uh, George's um, um, last picture, which was with Jackie Bissett here with Ben Benjamin, her agent, uh, and Candy Bergen. This is Bill Allen, the producer. Jackie and George did not get along, but when we went to San Francisco, it was all sweetness and light. Uh, it certainly wasn't that way on the set, but there they are. And we went up there with Jerry Ayers, who wrote, who was the screenwriter, and his pal, Dan Klein, who was adorable. And while we were there, right before we left, George gave an interview on the picture to a reporter at the Herald Examiner, which was still then published. And um, the first thing the interviewer said to George was, Pauline Kale says, and George cut her off and said, F Pauline Kale, just F her. She's never liked any picture I've ever done, just F her. And they quoted him verbatim with asterisks in the, in the um, article. And this clipping was overnighted to George uh, and we all read it. And of course, uh, Jerry Ayers thought, you know, it was about time to take a cyanide capsule. Anyway, the picture, had some a modest success. I like the picture. I've seen it a more pic more times than I've ever seen any picture because I helped George when they did the uh, post production and stuff and the debuts and all that. It was I like it. I have good memories of it. But anyway, um, we debuted it in London and Paris. George always sat in the front seat. He always had on every plane. It had to be the first two seats on the left. If they were different, he would throw a fit. A couple of times we were thrown off planes. I could go on and on and on. This is Bill Allen and this was at the Connaught again in London. After we got back to LA, this same room I saw on the news, um, I recognized that they were doing an interview with Joshua Heifetz, who's a young actor and I forget his name. And he did some 
things. He always, once a year, the Guardian would have him come over and interview him, I think. Then we went to Paris. We were staying at the Plaza Athene where I was um, for days finding new rooms. And George looked in on this bedroom that they had given him. I always had a separate uh, bedroom next to the suite. And George just looked at all this pink brocade and said, Richard, this is a whore's fantasy. Givenchy sent these flowers and George uh, could understand French very well. He didn't speak it, but he read it and understood it very well and hardly needed the translation. Um, this was on French television. And outside uh, his good friend, Pierre Barrier, who and his partner, Roland Oberlin, uh, we were just walking out of the Plaza Athene and these two women, very chic, noticed him, almost sneezed, and came back, and they were very sweet. And while we were driving around, I just had to jump out of the car and take this photograph, which I love, which is what we have, we still want more of, kind of moral to the story. Um, we went up to San Francisco, Ina Claire was George's idol as a teenager in New York City playing hooky from DeWitt Clinton High School. He would go to get standing room only tickets and you know see Ina Claire and everything that was going on in Broadway and the theater, even the Yiddish theater. And um, so we went up to San Francisco and helped Ina Claire celebrate her 90th birthday and she was sharp. She told us the story about how she sang a song from the play that she was in on Broadway in 1915 that was something like Hello, Frisco, Hello. Um, it was the um, first transcontinental telephone call. And she sang it for us. I mean, it was just like, I was sort of in awe of her. She was so much fun. And I began to call her Ina. And when she left the room, George said, Richard, to you, she's Miss Claire. Well, I mean, she called me. She didn't mind it at all. But it just was an indication of how reverential George was to her. So we went to the birthday party at the Huntington Hotel. And this is Whitney Warren, who was one of Ina's friends and George's friends. Whitney's father, also named Whitney Warren, was this gentleman here. He, he de designed, among other things, Grand Central Station and also was related to the Vanderbilts. And Whitney, I don't think, ever worked a day in his life and um, was, was quite a character and spoiled rotten. He was the only person that demanded a third drink before dinner at George's, so I would make it by that time, he couldn't tell the difference, but it was mostly all water. But um, anyway, he was sort of a bad boy, but George and he were very good friends. Now, the lady here over on the right, I just like this photo because of the, the cake knife and the thing across Whitney's face. But this woman is uh, Dorothy Spreckles Munn of the Spreckles sugar family, the people that brought the sugar industry to Hawaii. And I just realized, I just found this yesterday. I was looking up a few people that I wanted to get their names right. And she was painted in 1942 by Salvador Dali. The picture is now in the San Francisco Art Museum. And there she is. If you look up her obituary online, she's wearing this dress. These two people, this man um, was one of the monuments committee after World War II that went around to retrieve the stolen artworks that the Nazis had squirreled away, in particular Hermann Goering and his wife. And this man was a, um, a um, columnist in San Francisco. Now, somebody was talking earlier about Mae West. I found this, I think, on eBay. Um, but this is the way Mae West looked when I, when I met her at the time I was speaking about earlier. 
And this is a photograph. George always would correct people who did not pronounce his name correctly. It's, he would always say, it's Q-Core. And a lot of people used to get him mixed up with Adolf Zukor. And I remember in particular, um, Edie Gourmet, we bumped into her one time on the polar flight to London with uh, Steve Lawrence, and she kept calling him Mr. Zukor, um, which I had to giggle about because there was in a picture taken at this party in the National Enquirer that somebody sent to George. It was just a photograph with the caption, youngster May West admits to 83 with George Cukor, age 103 at the latter's birthday party. And it tickled George so much that his name had gotten mixed up with Adolf Zukor, who was in fact, who did live over 100 and did have this party, obviously, with Mae West. And so he said, you know, make me some copies of that. So I made some copies and he used to just write notes on that with that photograph and the caption and just send them to friends as a gag and nobody said a word. This is Mildred Jaffe and her youngest daughter. Um, and we went to Israel with the Jaffe's Mildred and Sam and Sarah Mankiewicz. And this was a party that Sarah gave at her cute little house in Brentwood. Sarah, because she was married to Herman Mankiewicz who wrote Citizen Kane, um, had no money. Herman gambled it and drank it all away and died in 1954. And the Jaffe's and George quietly through Frank Mankiewicz contributed to Sarah's um, upkeep in her later years. And one time Sam said to me, um, Sarah, Richard, would you mind, um, Sarah is gonna give her maid the Christmas day off would you mind going over and staying with her and, and just making sure that everything's okay? I said, of course not. I'd, I'd love to. So Sarah and I had a lovely dinner and she retired early. And she said to me, now, Richard, you know, the library, help yourself to any of the books and, and whatever you like to read. So she didn't have to tell me. I knew what I wanted above the mantle in her house behind George here it was the living room uh, were leather red leather bound uh copies of every screenplay herman worked on including citizen kane which had an earlier title and version in the volume called american it was just american so i went right over and i read herman's copy of citizen kane that night well the next morning at breakfast i noticed that there were these little interlined notes um, in pencil in a very neat hand. And if you remember, Citizen Kane has a newsreel in the beginning. Like for there, it said, just like WRH in France in 19 and things like that. And I, I thought that Herman wouldn't have written notes like that. So I asked um, Sarah about it. And what Sarah told me differed from what Sam told me. But what she told me was, that Herman called her up one day from the studio and said, I finished the script, I'm on my way home, which meant he was stopping at Romanoff's on the strips, which he did do and drank a lot and got behind the wheel. Coming up Benedict Canyon, he had a head on collision with Lee Gershwin and her maid in an American Bantam, which was a tiny car made in America before World War II. Anyway, Lee Gershwin was cut up and in the commotion the script fell out of herman's car who should be walking along but um marion davies um lawyer with the dog he picks up the script takes it back the script he made the interlineations or the notes and pencil and it was exhibit a in the trial against um herman and rko and and um orson wells and the whole shebang and later the script obviously was returned to herman lee sued herman in small claims court for plastic surgery and won and from then on whenever herman called sarah and said 
I'm on my way home, he would add, and tell Lee Gershwin to get inside. Anyway, um, here's Sam and uh, George. And George loved having Christmas parties until the later years it became a lot of kind of a chore. This is with Senior Hasso, his star in A Double Life that Ronald Coleman got an Academy Award. And by the way, George chafed whenever people would say, oh, the woman's director thing. He said, well, what about all the men that got Oscars? This was George's, George's friend, George Towers' son. There's with Senior Hasso, there's Georgie, there's yours truly, Walter or Alford was a friend of George's. There's um, Alan, and this was, I had this blue Cadillac at the time. We took it one time to the Academy Awards and George, I called him up and I said, you need a lift for the awards. I'm going, I got invited with Robert Cushman who worked at the Academy and he said, well, you know, I got to take my goddaughter. And I said, well, there'll be plenty of room. I have the blue car. And he, always, he just knew my cars by color. And um, he said, well, that'll be great. But we could pick up Mia Farrow over here on Rexford. And I said, wait a minute, George, Mia Farrow is your goddaughter. He's there. And then he would, he would do a, a trick voice. Yeah, didn't you know? Anyway, it was, that's another long story. The thing about George was that we could, we did, when we were together, it was nonstop teasing. You know, we were having fun and I could, so I was the only person I knew that could correct his grammar and he knew it. And I mean, he was just a perfectionist. This was after dinner, rarely in the Oval Room. Halloween. This was a friend of ours who, because he left George, George invited me to go on the trip to Israel. So thank you, Danny. This was entertaining George when it, where I lived in Silver Lake at the time with friends and my then partner, Greg, on the right. This was the birthday party. George's birthday was 7799. And so we always had a, a birthday lunch at Le Dome. And this is uh, Jack Larson and his partner, Jim Bridges. And this is Leslie Walwork. And anyway, but they used to give him joke gifts like this. I put a big black mark on it for obvious reasons. But his the best trick gag gift George got, I ever thought, was a black t-shirt that had a slogan on it. But what I really want to do is direct. I thought that was a good one. This is Sam. This is back in the Oval Room with Sarah and one of the Jaffe's others, other daughters, Naomi, George and Sarah. There we were, went to Boston, get through these. This is where on a hot summer night, we would have, Margaret would make us pacho and we'd have something light on the terrace. Kate Hepburn gave him that table. And one of our last big tricks, uh, trips was to the Biennale and, um, we watched the Regatta Storica, which is like the Venetian Rose Parade um, from the balcony from which Napoleon watched the same regatta, I believe in 1814. It was, I thought it was wonderful. There we are on the balcony. Then we went to the, um, the show, which was very glitzy. And we flew back, uh, and stopped in Washington, and we flew on the Concord, which you can see George is here. Re he was always reading. In this case, I'm sure it was the New York, or the International Herald Tribune. And here's our Concord waiting in the back, uh, which was a fabulous ride. I mean, I'll never forget it. And there we are, twice the speed of sound. 
And that very plane that you saw in the pictures earlier is now in the Smithsonian um, wing of the Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport uh, as a display. So you, I now can say that I have ridden a museum piece because I'm old enough to be a museum piece, I think. George died in 1983. The house sat vacant for a, too long. And um, it was eventually sold to the woman that owns the Ivy, who I think is a very nice person. I've never met her, but she did a complete change over gut out of the um, wonderful Bill Haynes rooms. And here is the, the spread that George had in 1977 in Architectural Digest. And this is that same room under the new ownership. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether which one looks better. I think that the new owner very much is into shabby chic. This was the landscaping The uh, Florence Yock and Lucille Council did George would hire them to do uh, landscape design on the movies that he directed, like Gone with the Wind. He was the original director. There's Vivian Lee in George's pool. That's what the pool looks like now. The outdoor dining area and today. This, the library and today. The guest room the hallway with the beautiful silver gilt Venetian uh, scallop furniture, the Blackamoors. The only thing that's left are the sconces. The oval room, suede upholstered, carpeted, and the suede is gone. The suede, by the way, there was roof damage and rain damage. The suede, which was replaced about 1980, um, by the insurance company at a cost of like $48,000 then, and it's gone. Now, this looks like the Oval Room. However, this is a house by John Wolf. George, remember I said he owned several houses around. This was one of the little houses uh, at the corner of Doheny and Cordell. And it was eventually uh, purchased by Sam Goldwyn's, uh, a grandson of Sam Goldwyn, and now is owned by the daughter of, Lou, I believe the daughter of Lou Wasserman. So it stayed in the Hollywood um, crowd, so to speak. But it, this is a replica of what the Oval Room used to look like. This is the living room in the John Wolf house today, or I presume it still looks pretty much like this. And the irony is that it was restored like this by Sam Goldwyn's grandson. And George is now buried with Sam and Francis Goldwyn in Forest Lawn. So it's come full circle. And that's the end of the, the, the spiel. Now, if you want, uh, if anybody's still there, I can um, answer any questions. Thank you, Richard, so very, very much for spending this evening with us and sharing your time with George Kukor and, and all the wonderful, wonderful stories. Um, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask Richard. And Richard, you probably, well, I, you I, might want to still be recording, so. That's okay, but I'm trying to get back to the, can you see me now? Uh, I can see you small, but I can't, but. You, you're, uh, you've got to stop the screen share. So hit your little green thing in the bottom and stop your screen share. My little green thing, huh? It, it, yeah, if you bring up the icons in the bottom of your screen, there's a share screen. I think I've lost it somehow. Uh, let me try to do this. Oh. So did, uh, did George pay you to, to, as, as his assistant for all this time? You know, I actually I'm going through a whole lot of paperwork lately, and um, I found a receipt from his accountant 
for $900 that he paid me to go on one of the trips. I don't know which one it was. I guess I could figure it out if I looked at the date, but he would give me like spending money and, you know, an allowance of some kind, but I didn't care. I mean, it was, I would have done it for nothing, but he, um, I guess you could say he wrote me off. Um, I'm still trying to, let's see. Um, I'm advanced sharing options. Um, post only, I don't know. I, I can't find the little green button. Well, if you're, well, if you're in share or screen share, you should be able to stop sharing. Uh, yeah. you found it. You, you've gone to the bottom of your screen with your cursor and you see share screen. Oh, hang on. Let me cancel. Stop. I can't find the stop share. But anyway, I can still talk. Sure, absolutely. It's not a problem. Uh, Richard, who was your favorite person that you met? Who was the favorite person? Uh, well, I think you met. I mean, I think the Jaffe's were fantastic. I mean, they were friends. They were like parents to me. Um, I mean, the most there were uh, there were larger than life people that I met. I mean, uh, Kate Hepburn. Uh, there it is. I guess you can see me better now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, right. so, um, yeah, I'm on the speaker. Okay. So, um, I mean, they were, but the Jaffe's were spectacular. The Jaffe's were amazing. I learned so much. The thing that was, was the best takeaway for me coming out of my twenties was learning about life and uh, perspective on life and uh, the fun and, and um, I don't know, I just never knew, I, I always knew older people, I was close to my grandparents and so on, but, um, but the Jaffe's were, were pretty, ex pretty amazing people. Anybody else? Oh, and by the way, um, Sam, oh, yeah. Sam, Sam was, uh, just to give you a little background on Sam, Sam was the sort of late in life child of, um, he had an older brother and sister. They, his parents emigrated from Russia. They had no money. He lived on the Lower East Side. And um, when it was so hot in New York, his mother would take him down to the river and they would sit on a park bench and she would stay up all night so he could sleep on her lap in the cooler air than being in the tenement. And um, Sam's sister married uh, B.P. Schulberg. And through her, Sam got, for, without a high school education, got worked his way up to being the head of production at Paramount in the 1920s when he was in his 20s. He produced his first picture when he was 23 in Lone Pine in the Alabama Hills. And I could tell you stories on and on and on. He bought the property for the Paramount Studios when they outgrew Gower Gulch and they needed a bigger lot. Sam made the deal. Um, I mean, he, and then he, then he took, he gambled everything in the depression and started his own agency. He could have stuck with Paramount, but he didn't. He went off on his own and, and became his own boss. And he retired at 60 and he lived to be a hundred. Fabulous. Fabulous. Well, Richard, thank you. Thank you all for coming on tonight. We appreciate that. Um, South Pasadena chapter, thank you for being a part of our, our evening. Um, my worthy matron, Connie Cashin, is here and can wave to everybody. And this will be the last public uh, Zoom for us. The September Zoom, unfortunately, is 